Hello, everyone. Welcome from across this gorgeous planet. We are one communion, many paths, one mountain, where our mission is what Barbara Marks Hubbard and Dr. Mark Goffney call the planetary awakening in love through a unique self-symphony. Together, we declare that the last day of the old face of evolution is honored as the first day of the new face of creation. I am Christina Tahal, the co-executive producer, along with Krista Josepha and Kirsten Zohar, and we're so delighted to be with each and every one of you here today. I welcome all the new people. Please do share that you are new in the chat box. We want to hear from you. When you do chat, chat to everyone by checking that your chat settings say all panelists and attendees and not just all panelists. Use the chat function to say hi, to let us know where you're from and to resonate the Dharma. In one communion, many paths, one mountain, we are connected, we are whole, and we're expressions of the entire process of creation. We are activating a new humanity and we are awakening as a new species, homo amor, the fulfillment of homo sapien. We are a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, a zendo. We are all of it. No one is excluded. Everyone is included. And we come together to attune to the evolutionary impulse awakening within us. Welcome home, everyone. We're overjoyed to be with you today in week 207. Let everyone know about One Communion, Many Paths, One Mountain. We are doing this primarily through word of mouth. And I can personally say that leadership around our community is an absolutely sacred opportunity. On YouTube, we are One Church, Many Paths, One Mountain. On Facebook, we are facebook.com forward slash one church dot world. I know that was a mouthful, but right now we are streaming live on both YouTube and Facebook. So if you could take a moment and copy either of the links from this Zoom chat box, share those live links on your favorite social media channels like Facebook or Twitter. After our communion, we'll send you an email to invite your family and friends and forward that email right after our gathering. Spend time on our website, www.onechurch.world. On the top menu of the homepage or the bottom of each page, you will find our membership links. Awesome news, a return to Eros, the radical experience of being fully alive by Dr. Mark Goffney and Dr. Christina Kincaid is now also an audio book. This is so exciting. And it's read so brilliantly by Gabrielle Anwar. I can't recommend the radically inspiring, important book enough. A Return to Eros helps all of us recognize more deeply how love's energy literally drives reality. Starting soon, uh, we don't exactly know when yet, but soon, the hour right after our live broadcast, we will be offering a special invitation to take your seat at the table of history as a revolutionary and global activist. In those first principles, deep dives, Dr. Mark will apply first principles, first values, a new story for a new humanity to public culture, like movies and different books. With that, I give you a little bit of what to expect during today's communion. We begin with a one communion recap. Then Dr. Mark sets our intention. 
David resonates the evolutionary love code we're working with. We move into prayer, then evolutionary sermons with Dr. Mark, and often with a piece from Barbara Marks Hubbard. Then Krista invites us to commit our outrageous acts of love and to contribute our gifts to this revolution. And then we bring everyone on to close for our goodbyes. Mark wrote what he called evolutionary love codes. Mark and Barbara studied those codes together, often comparing them with Barbara's own 52 codes for conscious self-evolution. These codes grew out of their radical commitment over a hundred collective years, crystallizing the new story of humanity and quote, evolving the course of consciousness and culture, which is the source code of love. Each communion is a standalone and every week's communion builds on the week before. One communion, many pass one mountain, is radically committed to telling the new story. So here goes my one communion recap from last week. First principles and first values the urgent and ecstatic moral imperative of our time. The only thing that can carry us through in this Renaissance moment is to articulate a new story based on first principles and first values. A new story means a larger narrative that accounts for more facts, more data, more interior science, and more exterior science. Included in that knowing is the unknowing, where we stand reverent and in devotion at the edge of the mystery. First principles articulate an evolving universal grammar of value and include the core universe story as well as all the derivative narratives of identity, communion, power, and desire. We're literally between utopia and dystopia. Ooh, painful. We go down. This could be the end of humanity, or we could ascend. We could actually incarnate the best possibility of consciousness that's ever breathed in the history of this planet. Here we are, moving into this new identity, knowing about this new identity, becoming and living and incarnating this new identity and sharing it with reality. There are first values and first principles that drive cosmos, like reality is transformation, like we are a series of transformations, like Barbara talked about last week, mass metamorphosis. Everything that's come before me lives in me. The animal lives in me. Plant consciousness lives in me. The animal consciousness lives in me. The cosmos didn't stop at carbon. It keeps going. It didn't stop at macromolecules. It keeps going. First principles, love evolves and it evolves all the way. Love is creative. Love is feeling inside, but it means its insides are lined with love. We move from separate self governed by the win-lose metrics that risks our very existence, where we are competing against everyone else, where we are not part of, where the universe is a me mechanistic universe to true self, where we are one with the entire field of consciousness and consciousness actually lives underneath and actually breathes reality into existence and we are inseparable from the field of consciousness. We move to where we know love is absolutely real, that it's love which governs all of reality, that we are unique configurations of evolutionary love. We embrace the feeling of self-evident goodness when we touch each other's hearts, when we touch each other's bodies, when we touch each other existentially 
and intellectually. We move from Homo sapiens to Homo amor. We, we reweave the information ecology and literally re-soul reality with an evolution, with an evolving set. It's the energy of radical insight, radical commitment, and radical revolution, where we actually know it depends on us. First principles are how we live, how we love, how we laugh, what it means to have purpose, what spirituality means, what science means. There's a shared narrative. That shared story, that global ethos for a global civilization, that is our greatest hope. That is the moral, urgent imperative of our time. With that, I invite us to more deeply enter into the holy and sacred space of one communion, many past one mountain. And I turn my word to you, beloved Dr. Mark Goffney. Thank you, Christina Tahel. Thank you. I look forward every week to being together with you, with all of us, right? It's just, it's such an important moment for us, for each of us individually, right? And it's such a wildly, right, important moment for the evolution of the source code, right? For the evolution of culture. And I look forward every week. And how many people are with me in that? Let me try and get this hair out of my mouth, which there's no way to do kind of elegantly. Like, how can you talk with a hair in your mouth? It's not easy. Okay, I think, I think we might be doing a little better. So how many of you with me look forward every week, right, to the Dharma recap? I do, right? Right, and what Christina de Hell does is she takes precise quotes and weaves them together and recapitulates, right, some of the key quotations, images, right, visions, and then we get to hear it, right, all of last week's church recapitulated. Now, everyone get that? Everyone get how important that is? Right, that's part of our practice, right? So we come together, we come together as revolutionaries, right? The energy is revolution. The energy is we're poised between utopia and dystopia. The energy is we're at a time between worlds, we're at a time between stories. When we can literally create a response to human suffering and to animal suffering, to the suffering of the planet, unlike any that's ever existed in history, we can actually create utopia. We have for the first time in human history the capacity to create literally heaven on earth. And at the same time, lurking, the system breaks down. We've been talking about it for a decade. The structure of the system is fragile. It's optimized not for love. It's optimized for efficiency. It's not optimized for resiliency. It's not optimized to take care and to nurture and to nourish but it's optimized for maximum profit, but not for the profits, right? But for the few. And while we want to honor radically gorgeous creativity and we love businesses and we love corporations, corporations are beautiful. Corporations are actually raising people out of poverty in multiple ways. And we love all of the holiness in the pharmaceutical industry, right? Let's stay away from kind of the easy bogeyman of superficial new age thinking. There's an enormous amount of good happening. And yet the very structure of society right, is fragile. Right? The gap between have and have nots. The fundamental breakdowns that lurk all through the system, all of them are based on a collapse of value. And we, even when we talk about values, we think regressive, we think fundamentalist. We don't understand that cosmos has inherent value. And that after all of the postmodern deconstructions of narrative, and after all of the, the gorgeous postmodern pointing towards the hidden strategies of power that claim narrative in order to support their power, yes, we, we, we buy into, we accept, we stand with all of the postmodern rejections of all of the false narratives. That's all true. And after all of the deconstructions, the reconstructive project is now beginning. And we're reconstructing value. 
We're taking the best of the wisdom traditions of pre-modernity and we're extrapolating their shared universal grammars of value. And we're taking the best of the value propositions of modernity and the best value insights of post-modernity, we're weaving them together in this Renaissance moment. We are in Florence. We are da Vinci. This is the most urgent moral imperative of our time. And that's what we spend every week doing. And we're doing it not as intellectuals, right? Although, right, I've been falsely called a public intellectual, right? Bad, bad designation. Don't want to be a public intellectual. Let's be public lovers. Let's be public outrageous lovers. Let's love each other madly. We don't want to do this in a university department with all due respect, subject to all of the mediocrity of the academy. We want to be excellent. We want to be excellent in love. Who can feel that? Who wants to be excellent in love? That's our intention. Our intention here, right? My, my job in this moment is to set intention. So is that okay? I want to set an intention. Let's be excellent in love, right? Let's love each other excellently, right? Beyond all boundaries and all particulars. And from that excellent love, let's articulate first principles and first values, weaving together a new whole greater than the sum of the parts. And let's actually be together. Let's be Da Vinci together. Let's be the evolution of love. The only way to actually alleviate suffering, to actually hold the most vulnerable among us, and the nature of existential risk is that all of us will become the most vulnerable among us. Catastrophic risk hits the most vulnerable. Existential risk, we're all the most vulnerable. Existential risk, risk to our very existence. So we're all vulnerable, every one of us. It's not too big to fail. COVID tragically has decimated the most vulnerable with the least potential financially, with the least economic security. It's one of the great tragedies of COVID. And we need to take care of who we are as, is how we take care of the most vulnerable among us. But make no mistake about it. Each one of us is among the vulnerable. No one is exempt. No one is exempt. Either we're gonna all hang together for real, we're really gonna be in it together, or it's gonna come apart fundamentally, and it's gonna all go down. What an exciting and glorious and beautiful moment. We're trembling before evolution. Who can feel that, right? Maybe we can capture it in the chat box, right? We're trembling before evolution, right? Can we capture that? Can we feel that, right? We're trembling. Who can feel the trembling? Right, who can feel the trembling? Anybody? Anybody? Can anybody feel it? Right, who can feel it? We're trembling. And we tremble with joy. And we tremble with yearning. And we tremble with desire. And we tremble with love. And we tremble with allurement. And we tremble with ecstasy. And yes, we also sometimes tremble with fear. Right? And we turn the fear into consciousness. And we come together. So here's our question that we ask every week. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready to play a larger game? We have a yes? Are we ready? Are we ready to play a larger game? Are we ready together to be excellent in love? Are we ready to be excellent in the articulation of first principles and first values? Are we ready to be excellent in moving beyond contraction, right, into expansion, expanding into the depth of our unique self identities? Are we willing to be excellent in the realization that each one of us is an irreducibly unique expression of the love intelligence and love beauty and love desire that is the initiating and animating eros of all that is? that lives in us, as us, and through us, that never was, is, and will be again. And as such, we recognize that our unique perspective and our unique quality of intimacy manifests our unique capacity to actually incarnate and gift the world with our deepest heart's desire. And that's deep, that deepest heart's desire is to pick up our unique self-instrument and to participate together in the unique self-symphony 
which is the evolutionary impulse pulsing in us and manifesting a new expression of intimacy, evolutionary intimacy, a bottom-up self-organizing universe in which we come together in our excellence, in our greatness, and we gift to reality, our irreducibly unique gift, our outrageous act of love. And we do it together. And we address every social and we address every challenge. And we create a cacophony, a cascading, gorgeous wave of excellent love across the planet. And we invoke the new human and the new humanity. With my beloved, beloved evolutionary partner, Barbara Marks Hubbard, we set an intention for this evolutionary communion. For this one communion, we're about to change the website from one church or the web address to one communion. As everyone knows, we've all decided to do it together. What's our intention? A planetary awakening and love through unique self symphonies. That, that understanding, that vision, grounded in a new story, which is woven together from first principles and first values, that's the revolution. That is the ecstatically urgent moral imperative of this moment in time. Cha. And so every week we, we try and work with an evolutionary love code. And Christina Amelon and David and Suzette are working on evolutionary love codes and with a group of a great team. So we can actually articulate and express them in, in written form. And sometimes we spend several weeks on a code. Right? And then sometimes we spend a week. So this week we have a new code. It's a really, really wildly exciting code, an important code. And I could not be more delighted than to turn to David to resonate. He's going to read it a couple of times for us from Cleveland, Ohio. Right, David, with our code. Welcome, David. Oh, my God. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Christina. So new code coming at you here. So find, let's find our deepest purpose, our deepest breath, and receive this together. This week's evolutionary love code. Our highest purpose is no purpose. It is only the pleasure of no purpose that gives us the power of purpose. Our highest purpose is no purpose. It is only the pleasure of no purpose that gives us the power of purpose. And I turn my word back to you, Dr. Mark. David, all right, let's get that everyone. David, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good afternoon, Cleveland. Good morning. Right? <laughs> yes, right, let's, yes. Let's read this together. Can we read this together? Okay, our highest purpose. What does that mean? Right? What does that mean? Like, what is that? Everyone, let's read that code. Let's read it together. Our highest purpose is no purpose. So this is something new. We've got to find this. Right? It's only the pleasure of no purpose that gives us the power of purpose. Right, so let's find this. Let's feel it. I'm going to read it one more time. Okay? Our highest purpose is no purpose. Right? And it's only the pleasure of purpose that gives us, and let's capitalize that P, that gives us the power, right, of purpose. So we're going we're to be with this really deeply today. We're going to be with this all the way. And this is a, a, a core first principle and first value of cosmos. We're going to enter it all the way. But let's first chant. Let's chant like we do every week, Amor. Right? And Amor, love. But love, not, not ordinary love but outrageous love. And what's our sentence that's at the core of everything we do? And if someone can write it in the chat box before I say it, right? We live in a world of outrageous pain, right? Let's find it in the chat box. Let's find each other in the chat box. Let's actually feel each other. Let's be in all the way. I want to ask, invite everyone, step in one more step. Can everyone step in one more step? Step in a step. So we can literally feel everybody. Everybody, let's step in from around the world. Let's step in one more step. No automatic pilot. We don't do automatic pilot here. Uh, we don't go through the motions here. We, we rip our her hearts open every week. We, we're, we're committed, right, to be excellent in love, okay? We live in a world of outrageous pain. What's the next sentence? The only response, and let's all of us write it because we all live it. Let's not wait for the three people who seem to be, let's all write it, right? We live in a world of outrageous pain, right? And it's only me, it's only my writing that's gonna make this happen. No one else is writing, right? The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. 
And what's the next sentence? What's the next sentence? Let's bring it up. Let's step in. We live in a world, right, of outrageous beauty, right? We live in a world of outrageous beauty. And the only response to outrageous beauty is outrageous love. And outrageous love is not ordinary love. Outrageous love is evolutionary love. When we say I'm more, we're talking about outrageous love. Outrageous love is not mere human psychological social construction of reality. It's not a, a fiction. Right? As my colleague Yuval Harari terms the depth of human experience and the depth of value, right? Yuval is lost in postmodernism. He hasn't gone to the place of the integration. Yuval, the author of Homo sapiens, he's lost in the, in the postmodern reduction. It's all the deepest values of reality are merely social constructions. No, there's no such thing as a mere social construction, right? Values are actually innate in cosmos and they evolve. And cosmos is driven and animated by outrageous love, right? Outrageous love, evolutionary love, right? The movement of eros to form larger wholes of greater value from separate parts. The movement to towards ever greater levels of depth of coherence, of uniqueness, of joy, of pleasure, of understanding, of reflection, of creativity, literally ever greater levels of intimacy, right? Evolution as the evolution of intimacy, evolution as the progressive deepening of intimacies, not as a metaphorical statement, but as a, a mathematical cosmological statement. It's actually the nature, it's the movement of reality all the way up and all the way down the evolutionary chain. Evolution as the evolution of intimacy. And each human being as an expression of that evolutionary movement that includes and transcends everything that came before. And we are each of us unique configurations of intimacy, unique configurations of desire. And that's what we feel when we actually chant Amor. Every week, Amor. And we use a different Amor every week from one of the members of One Communion, right, holding this together with us, who made an Amor. So I don't even know what Amor is this week, but whichever one it is, let's bring it inside. Mosa, uh, the first Amor that we ever did. The first one was made by Mosa. Right, so let's go with that first gentle Amor by Mosa. Take us inside all the way. Amor. Yes. Amor, 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 Amor. Amor, 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 Thank you, 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 thank you. So let's step in. We're going to come to prayer. We're going to do prayer today at the end. Let's step in now. Are we ready to step in? I want to step in deep to this new code together. Who's ready? Who's ready kind of like a deep? We're going to go deep into first principles, first values. We're going to go deep into this code. And it's subtle and it's beautiful. And we're going to, we're going to crescendo, right, with prayer. Okay? We good? Who's good? Are we good? Are we good? Are we ready? Are we, are we open? Right? And in every week, right? Every week we open again. 
We never take it for granted. We literally reopen every second. Every second, there's a decision we make. Am I open or am I closed? Every second, there's a decision we make. Am I gonna love this moment open or is this moment gonna stay closed? And in every moment, there's something that reality needs from me. Reality needs me to open. In every single moment. And reality needs me to love this moment open. And reality needs me to move through the pain and hold the pain and move through the trauma and hold the trauma and move through the contraction and hold the contraction and love it open and love it open. And when we love that moment open, we're literally loving evolution open. I'll tell you something beyond amazing as the context for stepping into this code and someone can help me maybe in the chat box in the original Hebrew there's a word in modern Hebrew for evolution, which captures a, a particular word from the original Hebrew and the word for evolution, evolution. So I'm gonna, I'll write it myself in the chat box but no one's gonna help me, that's okay, I don't mind. Leave me by myself, I'll write evolution. There we go, thank you, okay? So evolution, right? So the word is H-I-T, H-I-T, apostrophe, Heat, apostrophe, pat, hut, hit pat hut, okay, hit pat hut, and hit pat hut means, right, that word means evolution, that's the word, evolution, and what does hit pat hut mean? Hit pat hut comes from a three-letter root, okay, and the three-letter root, right, in English you would say petach, and petach means Opening, right? Abraham sits in his tent, petach ha'ohel, at the opening of the tent, right? Pitchuli achoti rayati, my lover, my beloved, open for me. So evolution is hit patchut, which is a process of opening. Evolution equals opening. So I want to get that deeply between us, okay? One of the core principles we've articulated is that reality is transformation, one. Reality is a series of transformations, two. As Christina Tehel recapitulated from last week, right? And three, my transformation and my series of transformations transform all of reality, right? That's one of, that's a first principles, first value that we know. And there's, we could talk about that for hours, but how do I transform? What, what makes transformation possible? Anybody? What makes transformation possible? Anybody? Anybody, give me the word. How do I transform opening? Opening, yes, desire. Desire is key. And desire allows for opening, right? Opening, it's when I open. I'm closed and now I'm open, right? I'm a slave and now I'm free, amazing grace, right? There's a moment of opening, right? And I'm trapped and literally all of reality turns when I'm trapped. Right? I can't own it. I can't find it. I'm too tired. I'm too exhausted. I'm too hurt. I'm too right. And all of us know this. And we all have different versions of it. And there's no one who's exempt from it. There's no one who's on this broadcast who's exempt from it. Anybody around the world. We're now, we've done, Christina Tell, what week are we in? Are we in 207 or 208? What week are we in? Somebody tell me. Right? Right? 207. We've done 207 weeks together. We've never missed a week. Barbara's been with us for for a huge piece of them, Barbara Marks Hubbard, and now she's with us in this, in this new way. Right, Barbara, welcome. Right? Right, Barbara Marks Hubbard. It's always about opening. Reality evolves, and I would say in the last few weeks before Barbara died, as Barbara and I were doing Holy of Holies, what we were actually talking about was how to change the source code Barbara had just been in Portland and we recorded the 11th hour program and we, were, we had finished the Planetary Awakening Accelerator. And at the same time, right, Barbara and I were talking about a particular set of dynamic issues in Barbara's personal life where she wanted to open in order to transform. And she was 89 years old and she could have rested on her laurels, but she, the question was, how do we open? So each one of us, I want to just ask, I want to just invite I want to invite something, which is, I want to open. Who's willing to say that? Who's willing to say that? I want to open. Just, I, 
And it starts with desire. It's the desire. I desire to open. Who's willing to write that? I want to open. But I want to open. But I want to open, right? Enlightenment's always about opening. I want to open. I want to open all the way, right? I want to open, right? I want to give you another way to say it with permission. Permission, everybody? With permission? I want to open all the way in this lifetime. Who's willing to write that? I want to open all the way in this lifetime. It's not, I want to open all the way in this lifetime. And I want to open all the way in this lifetime. It was a chant we used to sing um, 30 years ago. We were doing 25 years ago festivals, right? In Israel on the beach. And they used to sing this in the, the Rainbow Festival. You know, I'm deeply related to the to Oxford University and to Tomita Calls of Study. But I also have a great love for the fringes of culture which generate new reality. Like, rain, like with the Rainbow Festivals, and, and like, like leading edge think tanks, like, wow, right? Many pass one mountain like us. So there was a chant there, we used to chant, and it went something like this. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. Remember that, everyone? I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. Right? And that was, every movement has its beauty. The conservative movement has its beauty and its shadow. The new age movement has its beauty and its shadow. Libertarianism has its beauty and its shadow. So this is in the human potential, that dimension, right? That was called new age. This was the beauty, this is the best of it, the beauty of it, and right? not its shadow, right? I'm opening up in sweet surrender. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. Remember the second verse? Who remembers the second verse? I am climbing up. I am rising up. How does it go? I am rising up like a phoenix from the fire. Brothers and sisters, spread your wings and fly higher. I am rising up like a phoenix from the fire. And brothers and sisters, spread your wings and fly higher. Can't get better than that, right? New age at its best. Well, we love it, right? I'm opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. Right? But that opening up is not when I've just done a plant journey, right? That's, that's not opening up. That's doing a plant journey, which is beautiful, right? Opening up is not when I'm ecstatic, right? Opening up is not when I'm full flush with energy. Wow, I'm opening up. That's, that's the natural process of reality blooming me, and that's gorgeous. But the opening up that transforms reality for all of us is when I'm closed, when I'm stuck, when I'm contracted, when I'm hurt, and I choose to open. And that's hard. And when we're with someone we love and they can't open, we got to step back. When we push them to open and they can't open, we step back and we say, let me take responsibility for opening. Right? Right? If, if you're with someone and they can't open and you love them dearly, then you step in and you take responsibility. I take, I, I'm going to open. I'm going to open for both of us. And we trade. Right? If one person's triggered, the other person's got to step out of the trigger. Destruction in any relationship is two people getting triggered at the same time. Right? So if your partner's closed, you open. Okay, who's into that? We in? We in? We all the way in? Okay. So let's take it. Now, now we can go in. Now, can everyone feel the difference? Now I feel like we're together. Who can feel that with me? Now I feel like, okay, we're together. I can, we can feel each other now. Can you feel the difference? Who can feel the difference between now and like seven minutes ago? Who can feel the difference? Right, we're in, right? You can feel opening. Now my heart's open. I can feel your heart open, right? Our heart's opening together, right? Total different, right? All the way. Okay, so let's get our code. Here's our code. You ready? Here's our code. Here's the code. You ready for the code? We got the code there in the chat box. Here's the code. And our highest purpose is no purpose. And I want to try and I want to try and get this. And I want to try and get this in a, a few stages. And, and it's only the pleasure of no purpose that gives us the power of purpose. Okay, so here we go. So an animal, an animal operates based on instinct. And instinct is not a purpose that the animal's chosen, right? It's a purpose that is available through cosmos. So the animal doesn't, to the best, right? The animal doesn't, right, in a kind of 
choose. Let me decide to be an animal or let me decide to go into a different profession. Can't do that, right? And the career options for an animal are more narrow. They're more limited. It's not that there is no choice for an animal. Animals do have a level of choice, absolutely. But there's an instinct. There's animals have unmediated access to the larger purpose of cosmos moving through them. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna get that sentence. Let's get this sentence together. Animals have, because we're gonna go like six steps. Animals have through instinct, animals have through instinct, unmediated access to the larger purpose of cosmos moving through them. And maybe someone's gonna help me with this in the chat box, okay? So, so stay with me, okay? Whoever's, don't rely on someone else, jump in. Jump in, let's have five people write it, right? So we'll just, we'll feel it. Five people write it, we got five energies exploding. There we go, right? So animals, right, through instinct, they have, right, unmediated, unmediated, okay? And Raquel will make distinctions between animals later, but let's just go for animals now, okay? Just stay with me now, okay, Raquel, can you do that? We in, okay, right, right? There's different kinds of animals, it's absolutely true, right, right? Totally get it, totally get it, okay? But let's just get the general. Let's just get the general. Let's get the general, okay? Let's get the general. I could talk to you for five hours about the three different tracks and animals and the different levels. And I could talk to you about Michael Commons, right, who wrote a hierarchy of complexity in animal consciousness. I got that. Trust me. Okay, Raquel, I got it. Okay, I got it. Okay, just, 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 just stay with it for a second, okay? All right, stay with it for a second. Right? Don't get caught on the side. Yes, there are continuities of consciousness between animals and human beings. There are continuities of consciousness and there are discontinuities of consciousness, right? It's not that animals are more conscious or not conscious. That's incorrect. There are particular qualities of consciousness that animals have that we don't have. Bats, right? Dogs. Dogs live in a world of smell, as Oliver Sacks points out when he opens his, his book about the, the Mad Hatter, right? And bats obviously have, right, sensory intelligence and snakes, Right, are operating with an infrared intelligence in consciousness. So there are dimensions and qualities of consciousness that animals have that are unavailable to us, number one. That's number one. Number two, there are continuities of consciousness between the human being and animal that the great tradition, some of them knew, right, actually knew this, but actually in the last 25 years of science, we've actually taken about seven or eight areas which we thought animals had no access to ranging from tears, right, to grief, to culture, right, to levels of choice, right? There's a whole list of areas where it was very, we, we, we thought absolutely, this these is human and this is animal. And now we realize in each one of those areas that actually animals participate far more dramatically. Okay, so let's, let's but that's a context for the conversation. There's, but go deeper, go deeper with me, all the way in, all the way in everybody, all the way in, okay? so. There used to be a sense of absolute discontinuity between animals and human beings. Everyone got that? Discontinuity. Let's get the word discontinuity. See if we can catch it in the chat box. Let's do this together. See if you can catch discontinuity. Who's got discontinuity, right? Then science has pointed out what some of the ancient traditions knew already. Some of the shamanic traditions knew. Hebrew wisdom knew. Hebrew wisdom talked a lot about the suffering of animals. The ancient traditions had a sense of this in a very deep sense. Right? But the rational Western world created this discontinuity between animals and human beings. And now we're reclaiming a deeper continuity. And in the last 25 years, in the last 10 years particularly, there's a host, a plethora of studies, both on plant intelligence and animal intelligence, which are really important. And stay with me. And there's, of course, still major discontinuities, obviously. Right? There's particular unique and gorgeous expressions of human consciousness, which we call homo imago dei, a particular human expression. Human beings build hospitals, right? That's a big deal, right? So let's, let's be careful, right? Don't collapse the two, right? There's a, the third big bang, right? There's a momentous leap. There's a momentous leap from the, what's called the biosphere to the noosphere to, to the full depth of self-reflective human consciousness is obviously a completely different world. It's not about better. It's about a different quality, right? It's a different depth of knowing. That's self-evidently true. Now let's go deep. Okay, so we got, we got that framework. So now go deep with me. Ready to go deep? Who's ready? We ready now? Everybody ready? Who's in? Who's in? Let me feel. Who's in? Who's in? We got, we just did actually have quite a, 
quite a sophisticated, right? We got that sense of discontinuity and continuity. Animals have different qualities of consciousness that are not available to human beings. Human beings have more evolved consciousness in many realms than animals. And there are continuities that human beings and animals participate in, right? Absolutely. All in? We all in. Okay, now. Instinct. With that, we'll go back to instinct. Okay, so instinct means that animals, right, in the, the world of discontinuity, we dismissed animals, right, by saying, oh, animals are just instinctual. That's a mistake. Instinct means that animals have, let me say it again, now we'll, we'll bring it back. And who wants to write the sentence if you got the sentence already? Instinct means that animals have direct unmediated access, okay, direct unmediated access, right, to a, a larger purpose of cosmos moving through them that they're not accessing through the classical rational mind, right? They're not accessing through the poetic mind. They're not accessing through the human mystical mind, right? They're getting this direct access. They just know it. It's there. Okay. So that's one. That's a dimension of innate purpose, right? It's not purpose that emerges from reflection. It's innate purpose. Let's call that innate purpose. We got that. Who's got innate purpose. Who's got innate purpose. Okay. Now, Innate purpose takes you very close to what I'm calling no purpose. So what's no purpose? No purpose is we're not together in order to instrumentally get to a next step, right? I'm not kissing you in order to win your fortune in the Texas oil fields, which your father owns. You get that, right? You're not kissing me because, right, you want to marry me because I own six Tudor mansions, which you think are going to add to your status and ego. We're kissing for the sake of kissing, right? So touch, the realm of touch. Now stay really close now. Let's open our hearts, okay? Like all the way. Let's open our hearts all the way. Okay, in, in the realm of touch, when we touch each other, we seek to touch each other just because. And touch is not a human desire. Touch is continuous through cosmos. There's actually a proto desire in particles to touch each other. And not to touch each other indiscriminately. Particles are not promiscuous. So let's grab that sentence. Particles are not promiscuous. Particles are particular. Particles are particular. And although his meaning got obfuscated for many people, and partially it was his fault, but when Alfred North Whitehead talks about the prehension that lives in the subatomic level, he's referring to what I would call proto-touch. And Ken Wilbur and I have talked about this in many private calls that we did for many, many years on Monday afternoons, about this notion of proto-touch, this desire. Now, why do I want to touch? So I don't want to touch in order to accomplish something, although it does accomplish something, right? Touch generates pleasure and touch generates life. But I want to touch for its own sake. Does everyone get that? I want to touch for its own sake. And I want to get that word, for its own sake. For its own sake. And there's a word for that, right, in the lineage, right, in, in one of the great wisdom traditions. And it's called L-I-S-H-M-A, lishma. L-I-S at Lishma means I'm doing it for its own sake. No purpose. No purpose. Right? Why are we together in one communion? So on one level, it's for a purpose. We want to actually evolve the source code. We have to alleviate suffering. Right? We are da Vinci in this generation, right? You can feel the ecstatic urgency of it, right? And we talk about it all the time. But on another level, the reason we're here together is because we're one communion, because we want to touch each other, because we want to feel each other. We're here for no purpose, just because, right? It's not right now, right? Everyone, who can feel that? Who can feel that, right? Just because. Why are we together? Just because, right? What, what's our purpose? We don't have one, right? We're just here together because we love being here together, because we love feeling each other, because we love touching each other, because we love holding each other, right? Love is both purposeful. Love generates. Love is generative right? New sentence, love is a generator function of reality, right? Love generates new reality. Love is creative. Intimacy is creative. It's one of the tenets of intimacy. Intimacy is creative. And at the same time, 
Love is no purpose. We love each other just because. We love each other because we want to love each other. And when we make love, we make love in order to make love, in order to create love, right? Wow. We make love in order to make love. That's what we're doing. Love is self-justifying, right? Love is in some profound and gorgeous sense. Love is fully self-validating. It's for its own sake. That's why we sometimes call love love play. Love play. Sha'ashua in the original Hebrew is love play. And love play is for its own sake. It's no purpose. It's not pragmatic, right? It's beyond purpose. Can everyone feel that? It's like, and, and let's, let's just kind of just find this in like this deepest place. So the animal gives me a model and the animal that lives in me because I include and transcend the animal. But when I include and transcend the animal, whenever we talk about embracing the animal, we're, we're generally talking about the fierce passion and desire of a particular kind of sexuality. And, and there is, right? Right? When, when he or she says, he's an animal, she's an animal, right? So they're, wow, right? They're talking about, you know, that can be, of course, a terrible insult, meaning they're pre-rational. He's an animal, he's pre-rational. Or she's an animal, he's an animal. They're filled with fire and living passion, right? There's two dimensions. Animal critique, discontinuity, pre-rational, right? Animal gorgeous, right? Fierce passion. But there's something deeper. It's even deeper than that. The animal holds this quality of touch, right? This, the animal holds the self-validating inherent beauty of touch. There's a beautiful movie on Netflix that Christina saw and then we watched twice and I, I send uh, to my friend Sean and he told me he watched it twice with his family and a whole bunch of us, you know, you know, talking to each other have watched it together and it's called My Octopus Teacher. It's about the quality of animal, right? And it's the quality of animal that's on the one hand instinct, innate purpose, but it's also no purpose. It's just the ability to to be in no purpose for the very sake of being, for the very sake of living. So no purpose is when I begin to realize that life is self-validating by itself. That being alive, right? There's a text, there's mayit onen adam chai. What is there possibly to, to, to argue about? Chai, we're alive. Right? I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, right? We're alive. And, and livingness is so innately delightful and so innately valuable that it requires no other justification. I'm alive. I'm not alive because I'm alive. So when we love each other, right, when we experience pleasure, it's self-validating. But I'm not talking here about the pleasure. There's a pleasure of purpose. I'm talking about the pleasure of no purpose. Right? There, as we know, we, this summer we spend seven, eight days on six levels of pleasure and 22 principles of pleasure. Right? That's key to our first principles and first values. Let's take that out of the space now. Let's just go simple right here, right now. The quality of no purpose is now. It's valuable now. I want to give it a name, right? No purpose Right. The practice of no purpose is nowing. Can we get that in the chat box? Nowing, all right, as a verb. We're nowing, right? Nowing, right? Not knowing, it's nowing. And, and nowing, when I'm in the now, that's really knowing. That's what it means to know. And knowing in Hebrew is carnal knowledge. Adam knew his wife Eve. It's eros. And eros says it's valid right now. Right? It's not in order to get anywhere. Yes, there's a dimension of purpose. There's a pleasure of purpose, which is gorgeous, which is gorgeous. Animals have innate purpose and some realm of choice and depth, which is real. And purpose explodes on the human level and career options and social mobility right? and transformation explode on the human level. But purpose destroys us if we don't have no purpose. If our animal is not healthy and strong, 
our humanity collapses. Do you get that sentence? If our animal, and what's our animal? Our animal is both the innate purpose of cosmos moving through us, but what is that innate purpose of cosmos moving through us? It's love, right? It's the allurement. It's the eros of coming together. And why are we coming together? We're coming together to be alive. And evolutionary psychology misses this. It reduces it. It says we're coming together for survival. But all survival is is another word for life. All survival is is another word for self-love. I want to survive and I want you to survive because I love you and you love me and our lives are self-evidently valuable. Like who, can, who can catch that? Who can find that? Like that's no purpose. That's the glory of no purpose. Now, now stay with me for a second. The unmediated participation in source, right, the unmediated participation in divinity is the participation in the quality of no purpose. It's for its own sake. When I begin to actually experience that everything I'm doing is for its own sake, it has no purpose. That's the highest purpose, right? And yes, yes, I've got to access this other quality of the human being that sees, sees all of the cascading strategies and the implications and, and holds this higher purpose and makes evaluations and does a game theoretic dynamic about what's going to actually bring the most good for the most people, right, in the, in the most beautiful way. And, and we have to engage all of that strategy. And that's all true. And all of us need purpose. Unique self is purposeful. But unique self is also no purpose. So why are we together this week? Why are we together? No purpose. Okay. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to bring two pieces together. Who's with us? Is this too much? Is this too hard? Is this too subtle? Who's with us? Who's with us? Who's with us here? Who's with us? Who's with us? Okay. We with us? We together? We with us? Let's stay together. We with us? How, how are we doing? I want to bring two pieces together. Okay. Ready? So the unmediated experience of knowing begins with an experience of no purpose. Touching is good. It's good to touch each other. We wanna to touch each other. We wanna hug each other, right? We wanna, right, why do people cuddle? I was once gonna write a book on cuddling. What is the purpose of cuddling? Anyone know? What's the purpose of cuddling? Right, cuddling is for its own sake. It's the ultimate lishma. You're not trying to create a baby when you cuddle. Right? We're cuddling for its own sake, for the experience of cuddling, right? That's the quality of no purpose. And it's when I'm so deep in no purpose, and I can explode into purpose. And my relationship to no purpose is unmediated. It's an unmediated experience. So the core, the first principle, or the first value of cosmos is that love is an innate value, no purpose. Goodness is an innate value, no purpose. It's good because it's good. That's what a value means. That's what a first principle is. A first principle both accomplishes a purpose and it's no purpose, it's a value. So goodness, truth, and beauty are values, not because they're instrumental, but because they're values. It's beautiful because it's beautiful. You're beautiful because you're beautiful. You're good because you're good, right? It's not utilitarian, as Jeremy Bentham tried to argue. It's not just right for something. It's for its own sake. Wow. You know, Christianity, in its shadow forms, put an enormous emphasis on getting to heaven. Let's get to heaven. Purpose, purpose. But there were moments in Christianity which are much closer to our first principles and first values, were the Cathars, for example, C-A-T-H-A-R-S, the Cathars, they actually had this experience of no purpose, right? We're just here, right? And I wanna, I wanna see if we can, we can get a transmission, an actual feeling of no purpose. And I think you can get it from our words, right? Why do I love you? No purpose. So I'm gonna ask Christina to hell, and I wanna ask everyone if we can just shut our eyes for like three minutes, and we're going to receive a chant from the Cathars, this 12th century Christian small group that was actually massacred by the church because the Cathars made two claims. They, they claimed unmediated relationship to source 
And the church said, no, we're mediating it. We're in control. The Cothers said, no, unmediate it. And number two, the Cothers said, no purpose, just because. The pure joy of it. And the Cothers, of course, placed Eros in the center. The pure joy of touching each other. And touching each other emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, existentially, psychologically, physically, self-validating. So let's see if everyone can just for a second, we're just going to close our eyes for three minutes. We're just going to do this meditation and just hear the music. Or you can open your eyes and you can actually watch the screen. There's some words, but the words aren't that important. Okay, let's just access this energy. So take us inside. Thank you. 
listen to this text. It's in the chat box. The objective of the wisdom of the mysteries. At every point along the journey is liberating the power of the soul to the point where it can stand on its own inner strength and drink directly from its source with no need for any mediated training. Does everyone feel that? I'm drinking directly from source. Higher will, direct, unmediated. And it's from that inner self-knowing, right? So feel that together. It's from that inner self-knowing that everything becomes alive. It's this phenomena of the human being awakening to higher instinct, to no purpose, to the self-validating experience of outrageous love that leads the entire cosmos to awareness of itself. And it's from this inner self-knowing that the abundant stream of life is channeled through the merging of mind, purpose, and will, no purpose. That's what this is about. The merging of mind, which is purpose and will, no purpose. When purpose and no purpose merge and hold each other and dance together, then reality becomes alive uninterrupted by boundaries or particulars. Wow. Wow, right? right can everyone feel that? Wow. So let's take this second right now and let's pray. And this week, we're not going to use the holy and the broken hallelujah because it's all the holy and the broken hallelujah. And how does Leonard Cohen say it? And Krista, see if you can grab it in the chat box, right? Right? Even though it all went wrong, I stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my lips but hallelujah. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. Right? I didn't come to fool you. There's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter what you heard. The holy or the broken, hallelujah. It's purpose and no purpose together. So anyone who has a prayer, a prayer for anything like we do every week, let's just pray. Right? My prayer is, right? My prayer is, right? right? Is being no purpose. Right now in David, I pray for their energy to live my purpose and the joy to live my no purpose, right? Oh my God, right? I pray that, that someone reaches out to me. I reach up back just because, right? Praying for opening, right, to no purpose, right? I pray to breathe, touch, and open fully in this lifetime, trembling in no purpose. I pray to love just because, right? Who else has a prayer? I pray to always return to joy, right? I pray to focus and opening always deeper, right? My prayer is that people touch each other, right? My prayer is that all humanity feels the axis of no purpose source within them. And this week I'm, I'm reading the prayers without people's names, just so we can just feel them all come together. I pray to fully understand no purpose, right? right? And, and to not make understanding no purpose my purpose, just to understand. And I pray for courage, Right, for my partner, I pray to be no purpose always. And it's purpose and no purpose together, right? Mind and will, right? I pray to always keep opening to love in every moment. I pray to be excellent at love, right? My prayer is to open, even when it's so hard to do. I pray to love the moment open through the contractions to remember. Medea, it's so good to see you. My prayer is to be embraced by love as my heart opens and feels its glory. I pray to be excellent in love. Wow. So Chris is going to step into the space and, 
and share with us purpose and no purpose, what's happening, where we're going, right? Just to share for a second. So Chris is going to speak for a second. We're going to hold her with mad joy. And we're going to invite everyone. We want to really invite Krista to step up the next level and to be able to double her time. So we actually want to increase our power to resource Krista. And we're going to do that by increasing the membership in One Communion. So I want to invite everyone. And Krista will tell you how to do that. We're going to be starting fairly soon, every week, first principles. But we don't want to start too soon. We've been meeting the last couple of days. I'd like to actually complete this document called the Tenets of Intimacy. So that will be the ground, this entire set of like 30 first principles. I want to have that complete. That'll take to about January, I think. It's about the next three months. And so between now and January, we're going to do one communion every week, and we're going to do as we've done up till now. We're going to have one communion, and sometimes we'll go a little longer, sometimes we'll be shorter, right? But generally, it'll be an hour, sometimes there'll be a spillover, and we'll do first principles both in one communion and sometimes in the spillover, but we're not going to start the formal, right, hour, hour that we thought we'd start in two weeks. We're going to actually wait three months. We're going to actually, I want to really build it the right way so when we start, we can just actually blow it open and blow it open with the energy of purpose and no purpose. So we're going to, we're going to deepen together in these three months. We're going to deepen together on so many different levels. Like, wow, purpose and no purpose. So what we want to do is Krista, if you'll step in and share with us, right, the whole vision, and then Christina to hell, right, as soon as Krista is finished, if you can just bring us back in and we'll end with the last two minutes of that chant, okay? The Cather chant, the place where no purpose and purpose come together, okay? So I turn the word to Lady Krista, heart open all the way. Lady Krista, take us inside. Cha. Yes, thank you, Mark, thank you. And I'm excited to start sharing with you about outrageous acts of love, no purpose, just for the sake of loving. And I want to take you back to this documents, these three, three ways to commit our outrageous acts of love. And you can find them on our website and also on the Facebook page, just to bring us back to what outrageous acts of love are and what we are practicing together. So the first way to commit an outrageous act of love is by writing an outrageous love letter. And you can write that outrageous love letter to yourself, to a part of yourself, to a friend, a beloved, a colleague, a dog, God, a tree, and reality itself. And that's a beautiful way to access this innate value of no pur purpose of outrageous love within ourselves. And the second way is to write an outrageous love letter in which you tell the story of an outrageous act of love that you have committed or that you are committing to do in the future. So, for example, you can commit to calling your mother who needs your attention and who might need a listening ear. Or you can commit to apologizing to a friend that you know you need to apologize to. And you can write about that. And the third way is to write an outrageous love letter in which you tell the story of an outrageous act of love that someone that you know have has committed or that was committed by a person that you heard or read about so this can also be stories that you find on the internet something that inspires you that you feel that gave you hope and inspiration and we invite all of us to share our outrageous acts of love on our facebook page so you can find the link also in the chat. It's called Outrageous Acts of Love. And if you click here on the community page, that is where all of us can post our outrageous acts of love. And this will become a beautiful, it's already a beautiful wall of outrageous acts of love committed all over the world. There are songs being shared and stories and poems. And I want to invite you to join us there. And of course, the best outrageous acts of love that you can do is to go to our website right now. It is still onechurch.world, soon to be changed to onecommunion.world. And if you click here above on membership, that's where you can find how to join One Communion. This live stream, this broadcast every Sunday is totally for free. And maybe you're watching now on Facebook then I want to invite you to click on the homepage and sign up. It's absolutely free and you will receive our weekly 
uh, emails with the replays and beautiful clips that we are creating and you will also receive a reminder right before church right before our sermon um, before we start and you can click here on membership and become a member and as mark has just shared we are taking some more time to start actually with the deep dive sessions of first principles and first values a new story for a new humanity and i am really excited to share in the next weeks the things that we are creating and um, when we are actually going to start but for now let's look at our membership when you become a member of one communion you can choose your own contribution so it already starts from 25 dollars a month and you will get access to our online community which is on facebook where all of us are meeting and sharing and loving each other we have um, a study group that jamie and uh, christina are now actually facilitating studying together one of the courses of dr mark gaffney which is called wake up show up grow up so members are meeting each other to study together which is really exciting and if you sign up now to become a member you will still get access to all the nine in-depth courses that dr mark gaffney has created and also some of those courses are together with barbara marx hubbard so go and take a look on this page you will find all the information how you can sign up to become a member and this is an awesome and exciting way to resource our home and i can't wait to see you inside thank you so much yeah the space to you beloved christina and let's just gently, let's just end so gently. Let's end so gently in that place of for its own sake, right? So just, let's just take a second before that goes on, before that goes on, where is the link? I'm not seeing the link in the chat because if I want to sign up right this second, right now, where's the link in the chat box? So there it is, there it is right now. There's the link, okay? So let's just take a second and invite anyone who hasn't yet just to sign up. Right, to support Kristen, to support this vision, and to support this possibility. Right? And the chat box is going to remain there. You can copy and paste it. And so let's, let's actually make this ours. Right? First principles, first values, the, the most urgent moral imperative of this time. Right? Let's be the revolution. And Christina Taylor, give us just one more minute. We'll end there of that beautiful chant so we can just feel it all the way. <laughs> 